Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to another episode of eDiscovery After Hours. My guest this week is Nicole Teneo from Quinn Emanuel. This is an awesome episode. Nicole is a bundle of positivity, uh, so I know you're going to love it. We talked about maintaining mindfulness and balance in a really busy and stressful industry, how she overcomes barriers to build trust as a resident non-attorney in the legal space. Uh, we talk about which attorney she ran into at a hotel gym during a trial in New York City. Um, and we talk about everybody's favorite topic du jour, generative AI. Don't miss it. Sponsored this week is Proteus Discovery Group. Proteus is a financially independent, litigator-led e-discovery services and consulting firm that helps law firms and corporate legal teams during litigation and investigations. Check it out at ProteusDiscovery.com. Thanks for tuning in. Quick time! You don't know how to drink your whole generation. Drinks on the house. Yes, sir. Now, wait a second. Drinks are 50% off. Right. Now, no, wait a second. Double the price of everything. And I work only 16 hours a day. A union man only works eight hours a day. I belong to two unions. And now, e-discovery after hours with your host, Ryan Short. Nicole, welcome to eDiscovery After Hours. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. I think the folks at home uh, who are watching this can probably tell what we're drinking, but uh, for the record, what is it? A nice little mimosa. I know. I love it, too. It's so crisp and refreshing. Uh, usually, mm -hmm. the name, of course, is eDiscovery After Hours, um, and naturally, we're recording this after hours, but... Uh, but yeah, this is a nice little little crisp surprise. I think it took 47 or 48 episodes of the show to get a mimosa. So well done. Points for originality. <laughs> Brunch in with Ryan and Nicole. <laughs> yeah, season, season premiere this fall. Uh, it's really good to meet you. We were saying offline that we've seen each other on, on LinkedIn. So this is a really nice excuse to get to chat with you. So thanks for, thanks for covering out some time and coming to do this. Yeah, thanks for having me on. When I when I spun this thing back up after a little unplanned hiatus, I do a lot. I listen to a lot of comedy podcasts, like on the drive, on the commute to blow off steam or just get into a different headspace. And uh, and there's, you know, some of these guys do like a like a like a lightning round. Right. Or Mike Corbiglia calls it the slow round because he likes to dive deep in the answers. Um, so I took some inspiration. I'm going to toss some questions your way. All right. So let's just see what you think. All right. We'll okay. set up knocking down. All right. Uh, what is, Nicole, the favorite place you've ever vacationed? Ah, Bora Bora. Ooh, good answer. Yes. Was yeah. this just a random getaway? No, it was for our honeymoon, but man, what a honeymoon that was. Just like the, it was just so much fun, relaxing. I mean, you're in paradise, so yeah. what more could you ask for? Yeah, we enjoyed every second of it. It was awesome. Yeah, that's on the list for sure. I may have to make that an anniversary trip. We'll see. Yeah, right. I know. We uh, we decided to do it as a honeymoon because we're like we'll probably never get this opportunity again. Opportunity yeah. again. So let's knock it out now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. We did Jamaica for the honeymoon, and the highlight was climbing. Uh, we did like Ocho Rios, and you can climb a waterfall. It's like oh, that's cool. It's not the most treacherous thing. Like we should be clear, there were probably young grandparents that were doing it. <laughs> but it's like 900 <laughs> feet over like a course of uh, I don't know one or two miles. So it was it was a fun little fun little jaunt, and it was January. We lived in Chicago, so it was a it was a nice change of pace. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We went to besides Bora Bora, we went to Moray, which is really a little uh, like a sister island, and that one was really cool because we just got to explore a lot of it, and then we met a lot of the native people um who were from the island and so we get on sunday they all make their own foods and bring it to their families so we had befriended so many people there they're like hey you should just come with us and try some of the food and so we did and that was really like a, a cool and a fun experience as well oh that's awesome i love that when you know, it's always a balance when you're traveling right it's like you want to do like some of the touristy things because there's a reason they became touristy right it's signature to that spot but then you're also mm -hmm. like all right, but if this wasn't my vacation spot, like I want to see some of like let me live like the locals live for a bit, right? Yeah. So it's always cool to kind of see behind the curtain. 
Right, yeah, exactly. Nice. All right. First concert. <clears throat> oh gosh. Um I have like a memory of a hamster. Um <laughs> Probably new kids on the block when my mom took me, but in my my adult age or adulter age, I think it was the Ted Nugent concert. So Ted Nugent and new kids on the block. That is a fantastic <laughs> set right there. <laughs> oh man, I love it. Now, are your kids old enough now where where you can start the new kids on the block in the car and they like you know see how cool younger mom was? <laughs> not yet they're three five and six so okay. now when i start singing they're just like mom stop <laughs> <laughs> i got that the other day i've got five between eight and newborn and wow. uh, and yeah i i come to work to relax and um so, <laughs> so the other day i was singing in the car i was taking the kids to my oldest daughter's home from ballet and the six-year-old goes daddy Please stop. I like this song. <laughs> <laughs> well, points for honesty, kid, but let's work on your tact. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. We got the first concert. What's your favorite concert? Favorite concert. Um, Man, Red Hot Chili Peppers really put on a show. It was a long time ago. Um, it was when I was living in St. Louis, so maybe like 2003, somewhere around there. But yeah. that was impressive. Um, they just put on a really great concert. And then I'm a huge fan of Dave Matthews Band. So I've been to a few of those concerts as well. Yeah. And they were my favorite just because the music's so amazing. So. Well, and you named two, I'm a drummer, and you named two real, Chad Smith oh. from the Chili Peppers and then Carter Beaufort for, for DMB are like two di totally different styles, but two phenomenal players who both have a lot of respect in the industry. So. Very cool. That's so cool. Where do you find time to play drums? <laughs> um, I don't really. <laughs> we have a two car garage that has a minivan in one stall and my drum set in the other, and it collects a lot of dust. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> I don't. I yeah. I don't have the audacity to play when they're home because I'd like my children to have hearing when they're in their mid thirties, unlike me. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, it's a dream. One day we'll pick it back up again. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, are you a musician? I am not. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. No, I can't hold the tune, so all right. well, I enjoy time. singing, but I'm not good at it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's half of it. Uh, all right. What's the uh, most famous celebrity that you've ever met? Ooh, um, <clears throat> I was sitting next to Robert De Niro at a restaurant when I was in New York. Um, we used to go to New York for, when I was in St. Louis, we used to go to New York for trials all the time. We'd be there for months at a time and within a given year, probably six months. And we'd all, we always go to these nice fancy restaurants and every time we go, we'd see a new celebrity and that was really cool. But Robert De Niro was probably by far my favorite. Man, he is amazing. Do you know Tom Hiddleston, the actor? No. What is he on? He, uh, I don't know, but he does a great <laughs> De Niro. I don't watch a lot of shows or movies, but I, I'll do like talk show clips on YouTube. And the Graham Norton show, which is a riot, back to the comedy podcast that I mentioned that I was listening to, he, Tom Hiddleston did a Robert De Niro impression sitting on a couch with Robert De Niro. It was like the end of- That's cool. What <laughs> movie was it? Yeah, it was phenomenal. Well worth the look up. I'll send you the link after we're done here. <laughs> yeah, definitely. The other one that I met that was really cool was 50, 50 Cent. So I was at a trial and we were staying at, um, we were downtown, where were we at? Um, we were one of the hotels there and I went upstairs to the gym and I was running on the treadmill and he came up next to me and he started running. I almost fell off. I was like, wow, that's so cool. So I go back to my room and that night I was, the war room was on my floor because I managed the war room. And so I was going back and forth and this guy steps out and he was like, what are you doing? And I'm like, what business is it of yours? And he was like, well, I'm the security here. And I'm like, for the for the hotel? And he was like, no, 50 cent. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I was like, is he right here? And he was like, yeah, this is where his room's. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. I was like, my room's down here. My war room's over here. You should have him come down and meet my attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't. He had like a Howard Stern broadcast in the morning or something like that. And so, but I invited him. <laughs> Did you get to speak with De Niro or Fiddy? Either either one? No, uh-uh. Just stargazing. Nah, I'm not gutsy enough. 
<laughs> hey, if you can manage a war room, you can you can finagle an intro to a celebrity. So next time, That's true. <laughs> next next legal week, we're gonna go. We're gonna have restaurant pop. Have a have yeah. like a full course dinner and see who all we can see. <laughs> uh, okay, last question: Is it GIF or GIF? I say GIF. Good, good answer. Right. <laughs> That's right. I'm, I'm compiling. I've got I've got somebody now who edits these shows for me, and I'm going to do a super uh-huh. cut at the end of this year of everybody's answers, and then we're going to have a little in, like an internecine war in the industry about proper pronunciation. We're going to tally. Well, good. Up. We can finally come to an agreement across the industry. <laughs> yeah, I'm not touching. I'm not touching the should e discovery have a dash because I'm afraid that having a dash will win, and I just can't. I can't stand for that. So I'm not a dash person either. <laughs> yeah, I don't dash email. I'm not gonna dash e-discovery. And also it should just be it should just be discovery, let's be honest. Like, you know, it is what it is. Uh okay, yeah. so you mentioned St. Louis, New York. I think you're in Salt Lake now, right? Somewhere in that area. So where's home? Where'd you where'd you grow up? Grew up in Missouri, um, just out of St. Louis. And okay. then I moved to DC for about two and a half years. And then I was in New York for like 14, 15 years. And then we've been in Utah for two and a half. So it's culture shock going from Missouri to D.C. D.C. to New York. Yeah, New York has taller buildings, but it's some, you know, less political, more capital, but, you know, similar kind of fast coastal feel. Right. And yes. then like a reverse culture shock going from New York to Salt Lake. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which adjustment did you find to be the most difficult or the most or, or conversely, the most like relaxing or, or relieving. Utah was the most relieving. Um, New York by far was the most stressful. I'm glad I went to DC first because being a, you know, a Missouri girl, I didn't know a lot about politics. I just like did not have my people skill set yet. And so it, it taught me a lot being just like kind of thrown in the middle of it and was, you know, faster paced. And then you go up to New York and it's just like, you know, get out of the way. Um, but New York, I had a hard time adjusting to it first. It took me a lot of yoga, a lot of meditation to realize that it wasn't against me, that that's just how the people were. And that's just how they spoke. Um, and then, you know, a few years in, I became one. So, <laughs> uh, now everyone Seth tells Meyer. me you have to slow down talking, Nicole. <laughs> yeah. Seth Myers has a bit, he has a special called lobby baby. And he talks about how his second son was born in the lobby of their of their apartment. And the first child almost was, um, but they were racing in a cab to the hospital. And he goes, New York is the only city in a world where a woman can be on all fours in the back seat of a cab, screaming at the top of her lungs and nobody batted than I. <laughs> <laughs> so true. <laughs> ah, New York. Uh, so, all right. So, what what uh, caused uh, leaving the Midwest was a was a career in law always the plan? It was. It's always been my plan. And in two thousand and three, the the Midwest was just kind of getting into e discovery. And mm-hmm. one of my mentors, who was my boss at that time, um, kind of pushed me, and he was like, "Nicole, get out of here. Go explore what else is out there." So I went from that to Jones Day where I was a trial consultant. And then I was at Wilmer Hale for a little bit. So I just went from like here to here um, in a short period of time, but it was exciting. And like the East coast and the West coast were more up to date on like e-discovery and what was going on because we were still, you know, pushing papers, using bait stamps, different things like that, coding um, in, you know, in the Midwest. And it just really hadn't had much, it, it just, the growth wasn't there yet but they were on the East Coast and the West Coast. And so when I shifted there, it really just kind of shifted my career, my trajectory of the types of cases that I worked on, the types of data that I worked with and different things like that. So it was definitely exciting. So did you, so you moved intentionally then for the career, was it, you know, even in those early, the days of the early 2000s, was it e-discovery you're doing you mentioned a war room right which is ancillary and not necessary there's some overlap in the venn diagram right but but not Mm -hmm. exclusive so were you deciding between paths or were you pulled towards e-discovery or pushed towards e-discovery um listen if i could do trial consulting my whole life i would uh it's just it takes a toll 
yeah. with the travel. I would be gone 10, 11 months out of the year. Um, and if I ever came home, it was just to get a new truck of equipment to ship out. Um, you know, back then nothing was wired in the, in the courtrooms. Right. And then you're running your own T1 lines in the hotel rooms at some of the places. <laughs> like it was, it was fun. It was, it was crazy times, you know, you're setting up servers and routers and like people don't even think about the time back then of all you had to do just to set up a war room. Um, so it was really exciting. It just became a toll of, you know, all my life. And I wanted something a little bit more stable and I got into e-discovery. It was definitely more stable. I was just in an office for 24 seven rather than being in a nice hotel. So <laughs> there's a lot of that for sure. Um, <laughs> One of the questions that I have for you is, you know, you are um, like by all impressions and then, you know, validated through this conversation, like a very warm, positive presence, right? And this industry can wear people down. So, yes. so you, you had a really interesting post the other day about, you know, I, I'm, I'm facing this metaphorical mountain. You had a picture of beautiful mountains in the back and you're talking about this kind of metaphorical mountain and you're like, I had all this work. I had just dropped off my kids and it's tempting to just go dive in, but I intentionally took time to just sit and meditate. You already mentioned meditation and yoga once in your transition to New York. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about kind of your, your wellness routine, whether that's, you know, physical, spiritual, mental, what is it that, that you do? What are some nuggets that people could take away that have kept you uh, to be this very positive force in an industry that can be very stressful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I follow, follow, I follow positive people, um, on social media because a lot of that negativity and what's kind of put out there will definitely impact you, whether you know it or not. Um, subconsciously, it definitely will. The music that you listen to will as well. So I always am, um, intentional about the music that I listen to. But on a daily basis, even if it's five minutes, I meditate. I try to do it first thing in the morning. Um, always try to hit the gym as much as I can when I can squeeze it in. Um, and then just always approach conversations positively. It, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, if you're working with a case team, because we're always in a high stress environment, right? And you're working with a case team that's up against a deadline. And it's just the conversation and the attitude that you bring to the table will help them pivot theirs as well. And I always felt that with trial consulting because I was also very young and not stressed out yet, but everyone else seemed very stressed out. And so I would come in with, you know, kind of, you know, joyful, um, you know, excitement, and what we were doing and working on and just kind of like positivity and it spreads. It really does. It's contagious. Um, I think a smile is contagious and also your attitude. So coming in with that also helps the environment around you. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Who are some of the positive influencers or people that you follow? Uh, Gary V. Yeah. Yeah. He's a good one. Um, he always, Especially in like a, a leadership role or a management role, um, the advice that he gives kind of helps you reevaluate some of your decisions, your decision making process or um, the way that you think about things. It normalizes um, being a leader or being a manager because that's also very stressful. Um, and when people are genuine and authentic, it helps you relate to them and then it helps you feel a little bit more normal because I think everyone, a lot of people hide it really well. And then you're just like, you know, especially the, our legacy who's coming up, see us as like, oh, you know, everything's perfect. You know, kids are coming out of law school, like, oh, great. I can't wait to join, you know, this big law firm or, you know, be an attorney finally. And then it's just like reality hits them yeah. and they don't realize it. And so it's, you know, it's it's also being authentic and genuine to our legacy as well. So they can be thoughtful and real with the way that they approach their life post, you know, college or or whatnot, because it's going to be, it's going to be, it makes a huge, a huge impact on you, especially when you're considering like your mental health. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's very true. Um, how do you, there's a very real thing, and I'm a transplant into this space, right? I, I was 
I had a decade in another industry. I, I came out of my you know business school and was looking to do something more entrepreneurial. And that, that's why I met the founders of, of the shop where I am now. And um, one of the things that surprised me, and I frankly find it a bit comical, is this distinction between like lawyers and non-lawyers, right? And I understand that there's ethical, you know, responsibilities that attorneys are held to. And there's, you know, I didn't go to law school. I went to business school and, and all these other things. But I, 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 I find it comical, frankly. Uh, but there is a little bit of a barrier for folks um, in any, you know, the umbrella of legal tech, whether it's e-discovery or not, there is an mm -hmm. umbrella or, or rather there, there are barriers, you know, that we have to overcome to say, listen, these things are, these are valid, they're ethical, you can apply them, it's going to help your sanity, it's going to increase the time that you can access, you know, you can, you can devote to, to substance and strategy, right, it's going to be better from a cost perspective for your client, how is it that you overcome these hurdles, and, you know, you've been at a handful of really large and well-respected firms, how do you establish credibility internally and get buy-in from case teams to allow you and your team to say, listen, let us handle this stuff because we're really good at it. And then you can go do the things that you're really good at. Right. Yeah, that's a, um, it's definitely a hurdle that I think all legal technologists, legal professionals kind of have to overcome. But I truly believe that it's it's building trust with the attorneys um, that's how I've done it. I, I have different strategies that I use with the attorneys too. I always try to empower them, make them shine, especially associates, um, partners in certain areas as well, because associates, you can back channel them to give them the information for them to shine in front of the partner, right? Um, or here's some analytics, let me teach you it on the side. And then you can bring this to the partner of how you can, you know, drive efficiency and getting these documents out faster. And then for partners, um, I've worked with a few partners who weren't really e-discovery savvy. So for me, it was understanding what the call was about with the client and then giving them kind of prep notes for that call and then offering them, hey, I can be in your office. You can text me. We can instant message. However you prefer to communicate. If you need anything from me, let me know or just ask for me to speak up. It, it empowers them to have the resources and the support that they need in order to be well positioned in the conversations that they're having. So through that, you build trust with them and then they start coming back to you more um, for that type of advice and discussions um, as it relates to e-discovery or our industry. I love that. I especially love um, you know, your comment about making associates shine. I, it always, it's a head scratcher to me. You'll hear people, you know, in, in the legal tech space talk about, oh, it's all about partners. You got to get to partners. And I'm like, well, associates are tomorrow's partners. Oh, if you mm -hmm. care about them right now when they're a nobody, how, you know, how loyal do you think they're going to be to you when they have signing authority, right? When they've got a lot of political power. So yeah, I love that. Right. Always a win when we can make an associate shine for sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. Last question for me, generative AI and e-discovery. Overrated, underrated, or appropriately rated? Appropriately rated. Um, I am definitely an advocate for AI and Gen AI and its use in the legal industry, safely, of course. Um, yeah. I think there's different levels of AI that can be applied to different practice areas and for different use cases. And I think it will really, um, complement uh, legal professionals and also attorneys in the work that they perform. And I think that it will enhance the way that they work as well. So I think it's very powerful. Um, I get nervous and skeptical with how many service providers kind of came up with their own platform so quickly. And it takes time to kind of chip away at that, to understand like, what were your prompts? What makes up this? What is your environment? Like, is it closed with when a tenant within an environment? Is it open? Like, it's the questions that you have to ask. And it's um, a lot of the industry right now, when you're talking about legal departments or law firms, they don't know the questions to ask if they don't have the resources internally to do that. And those resources are gonna be the ones who protect them and ask the challenging questions to these companies to make sure that they're building a defensible, a safe, and a um, 
and are a, a defensible and a safe process and they're properly using the technology for the service that they're providing. So there's a lot that goes into it. A lot of people just kind of want to adopt it or they're scared to because of these reasons. And I feel like you kind of need that interme intermediary that can connect the two. This goes back to e-discovery. It was before when everyone was skeptical of e-discovery and it was kind of making that leap and then making the connection and teaching them the gap between you know legal and e-discovery. And now we're to the gap of e legal and AI. It's just a different point in our lives and our careers. And it's just, again, understanding the the back end to make sure that it's properly um, performing the way that it should. Yeah, I think that's I think that's exactly on the nose. And to me, Gen AI is a great illustration of skepticism is good and healthy, but cynicism is bad, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're skeptical. That means you're probably not going to get burned <laughs> like some people who do silly things like not check citations, right? Um, but if you're cynical, you're never going to apply it at all. And you're never going to use a closed system that's been vetted that is not generating new info. It's summarizing exi an existing corpus, for example, right? So you can you can pick and choose your landing spots and grow incrementally. And that's ethical and that's defensible and that, that checks the right boxes to uh, you know, I had a history professor once who talked about how so much of human progress is evolution, not revolution, right? Mm. And people from a marketing perspective, I think software and services, uh, you know, providers are always so quick to talk about revolutionizing something. It's like, that's scary to people. Revolutions are yeah. unsettling and there's a fog of war that's very real, right? But evolving, right, iteration that's that's interesting. That's expiring. Well, what does that mean? How can we do that? What's the first step? And I think the message needs to shift. And I'm hoping I've said this on, on uh, another conversation or two already, but I'm hoping that the industry learned the lessons of overselling par and then having a decade of delayed adoption. And I'm hoping that they do a better job of messaging Gen AI. So we'll see. Right. Let's check back. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, right. Um, to, to go back to the point that you said, too, is <clears throat> being able to evolve and add on certain components, I think, is really powerful because it also impacts the way that um, the firm handles the reaction to it. Going back to, you know, humans thinking that robots are going to take over their jobs, which they're not. They're just going to complement them. But I've worked with a lot of PI firms and mass tort firms where I can say like, hey, add these AI fields that do the summary, right? Summarize your police report, your deposition transcripts, your, your medical records and different things like that, where you can extract certain information. Like you can start leveraging it. You can educate your firm and your staff of why we're using it and why it's beneficial and how you're going to add value and it's not going to replace you. And as long as you have those conversations and like you said, evolve, I mean, you're going to, you're going to see a lot more, a lot more firms, just a lot more legal professionals and attorney kind of gaining that competitive advantage and then also leveraging um, the the playing field when they utilize tools like these. So that's exactly right. Well, Nicole, I, I think I might have enjoyed the mimosa a bit more than you did. Oh. But uh, thank you so much for the time, the candor, the thought. This was fantastic. So cheers. Thank you for having me. Cheers.